Go ahead, Patrick. Let's start. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Patrick Reidenbach, your co-moderator together with Ida Johnson for today's MAP webinar on the rise of challenger banks, BSP approved digital banks, which is a project of the MAP Corporate Governance Committee and the MAP ICT Committee. Please settle down comfortably. We will begin our program in a short while. So uh, may I first uh, request everyone to pause and bow our heads for a short prayer to be followed by the Philippine National Anthem. So, our most merciful God, we come to you in our weakness. We come to you in our fear. We come to you in, with trust for you alone are our hope. We place before you the disease present in our world and we turn to you in our time of need. Bring wisdom to our doctors, give understanding to scientists, and thou care givers with patience, compassion, and generosity. Bring healing to those who are ill, protect those who are most at risk, give comfort to those who have lost a loved one. Welcome those who have died into your eternal home. Stabilize our communities, unite us in our compassion, remove all fear from our hearts, fill us with confidence in your care. We also pray for the eternal repose of the souls of, we lost uh, three good friends in the MAP uh, community in, within a span of a few days. Uh, MAP past president, uh, Ramon C, who was the vice chair of Asia United Bank. He passed away last uh, September 16 at the age of 91. You have um, Ding Wenceslao, chair of DM Wenceslao and Associates, who passed away September 17 at the age of 78. And another MAP past president, uh, Eddie Go, chair of Hyundai Asia Resources, who passed away in September 18 at the age of 83. Amen. Now, uh, Philippine National Anthem. Ang awit ng Pilipinas. Today's webinar of the MAPSI uh, of the, uh, is a joint project of the Corporate Governance Committee and the ICT Committee, with the latter being chaired by yours truly. Uh, to deliver the welcome remarks, may I call on the chair of the MAP Corporate Governance Committee, Attorney Cesar Villanueva. Thank you, Patrick. Our distinguished speaker and panelists, fellow MAP members, friends, ladies and gentlemen, good noon. On behalf of the MAP Corporate Governance Committee, I would like to welcome all of you to this MAP MAP webinar on the rise of challenger banks under MAP CEO Academy. We give special thanks to our governor, Governor Benjamin Jokna, Mr. Shalish Baidwan, Mr. Manish Bai. Mr. Arvi Devere, Mr. Jojo Malola, Ms. Laila Martin, and Ms. Long Pineda for sharing their expertise with us today. Today's webinar is a joint project, as mentioned by Patrick, of 
the Corporate Governance and ICT Committees for the MAP CEO Academy in order to provide MAP members and other business leaders with practical insights on the relevance and expected contributions of digital banks to the Philippine economy. This is the fourth and the final project of the Corporate Governance Committee this year. Our first was a webinar on a new age of capitalism in the Philippines, which was held on March 16 and was led by the MAP Management and Human Capital Development Committee. Our second project was the webinar on the various rehabilitation and insolvency schemes available under the Financial Rehabilitation or Insolvency Act, FIA, and other commercial statutes. This was, that was held on March 26. Our third project was the July 13 MAP General Membership Meeting on governance champions on how independent directors create value in publicly held companies. Today's webinar is in line with the MAP Board of Direct Governors three priority program, namely safely reopen the economy, promote shared prosperity and ESG, environmental, social, and governance, and enhance the member benefits via best practice sharing. Specifically, today's webinar addresses the governance part of ESG. At this point, let me thank Ms. Ida Tiamuson, who is the vice uh, chair or co-vice chair of the Corporate Governance Committee for putting this webinar together and for co-moderating this webinar. But thanks also to Mr. Patrick Reinenbach for the participation of the MAP ICT Committee and for co-moderating the webinar. Lastly, let me express our deep appreciation for the unbridled and professional support that Arnold Salvador and his team has extended to committee throughout the year. Thank you one and all for joining this webinar and keep well, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Villanueva. Okay, at this point, I'd like to call on our co-moderator, the co-vice chair of the MAP Corporate Governance Committee and the president CEO of Opal Portfolio Investments Inc. She's also a trustee of both Fintech PH and FintechAlliance.ph. Ms. Ida Changson. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, we'll go through first housekeeping, so some reminders before we proceed with our webinar. As in our MAP protocol, audience cameras are switched off and you are automatically muted. However, you are encouraged to, do, to type in your questions. You may submit this in the Q&A box. Kindly include the name of the panelist you want to address your questions to. Due to time limitations, we may not be able to have your questions answered live. Hence, panel members, do kindly, and you are encouraged, subject, of course, to time limitations, to please, if you can, answer the questions directed to you straight in the Q&A box. We may, though, still have a chance to take up a couple of questions live. You will only be able to also see the speaker and panelist and will not be able to view the participants. In the interest of time, we have also dispensed with the lengthy introduction of our panelist and speaker. Their CVs, though, will be flashed on the screen. This webinar is also in three parts, briefing of each digital banks, followed by keynote speaker, then the much-awaited Q&A panel. And lastly, we're also happy to tell you that you can catch or catch this again this session, as we are recording this, and we are live in the Facebook page of MAP as well. So I'm sure, Patrick, no, you are excited as I am. We have been advised that this webinar actually is one of the highest registrations this year. And I believe because of our distinguished keynote speaker, who will join us a little bit later on, and a high caliber panelist, and also because a lot of people are actually interested in this new 2021 challengers, of course, the new digital banks. 
So may I just give a little bit of an intro about this webinar. So per Moody's, the penetration of mobile wallets has exceeded that of bank accounts as fintechs are banking on digital payments to gain foothold in the Philippine financial system. To date, a large percentage of Filipinos still do not have a bank account. The remaining pie to serve is still huge, and these digital banks are expected to help reduce the financial inclusion gap, as well as manage the barriers hindering financial access. Last December 2020, um, Patrick, no, BSP issued a guideline on digital banks, which states only, I repeat, only banks granted with digital banking license may, may represent itself using digital banks. So they're the only ones allowed to use digital banks to the public. Um, and also this uh, guideline on the digital bank or neo bank as a bank with only one main office, no branches, and at least a billion in capitalization. In response to this, because it's so great, it's so hot, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas had to announce a cap on the license to be awarded to only seven, seven digital banks only. We are happy that we have with us to date the sixth approved digital banks, OF Bank, Tonic Bank, Union Digital, Uno Bank, GoTime, and Maya Bank. To start off, we're now on our first part of this session. May I now call on our first panelist, if we can put up our first panelist, please welcome the co-founder and CEO of Uno Bank, Mr. Manish Bai. Thank you. Thank you, Ida. And congratulations to the organizers and congratulations to you too in making this the most viewed uh, seminar till now uh, and giving me an opportunity to kind of introduce uh, Uno. So what, what is UNO? What are we doing with UNO? We are creating a full spectrum digital bank. Now, what does that mean? It means one single trusted interface to meet all your financial needs with speed and ease, all your life's financial needs. This is borrow, save, transact, protect, and invest. With UNO, our focus is on covering the mass and the mass affluence segment. And one of our unique differentiation would be around a world-class tech stack. As many of you know, we are a greenfield bank. We are a classic startup fintech, which means that all our technology is built from scratch. We have the luxury of making sure that we have the latest innovative technologies incorporated in our build out. It's built with an agile and a scalable approach, leveraging data analytics, machine learning, AI, and other new technologies which are available today. Lastly, UNO has been founded and led by a team of professionals who are ex-bankers, technologists, uh, build lending, lending business. And we want to bring that entire experience in following our vision with this startup fintech, which is making banking simple, better, and accessible for everyone and helping elevating the financial management for the people which we serve. Uh, next slide, please. Now, as I mentioned, though we are a full-fledged, full-spectrum digital bank covering all aspects of financial needs and all banking services, our core strength, our core positioning is around credit. The founding team of UNO has the experience of building one of the largest consumer lending businesses in Southeast Asia, and also participate in various banking products uh, innovation, as well as experience is managing balance sheet across different part of the region. Next slide, please. Now, we believe that financial inclusion is beyond just banking account. Though there is a lot of conversation on financial inclusion with banking account, and yes, that is important. Everyone should have a transaction account and a savings account. And it's a big challenge in Philippines, but a greater challenge, uh, which is not that talked about often, is around consumer credit. 
Uh, for example, unsecured consumer loans in the Philippines are just two and a half percent of GDP and much lower than many of the countries in, in this region. So we are very, very focused to kind of change that, make a difference out there. And the team UNO stands very committed to move the needle here uh, in a big, big time. And we look forward to this opening regime and we look forward to working closely with our fellow other digital bankers and traditional bank and the entire ecosystem to make a lasting impact uh, in Philippines. Thank you. Over to you, Ida. Wonderful, Manish. No wonder it's called UNO. UNO as in one. It's a one-stop shop. Yeah, uh, and no, no wonder you allowed me to go first. Maybe the name influenced it. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, Manish. At this point, may I call on our second panelist? Please welcome good friend, co-founder and CEO of Union Digital Bank, Mr. R.V. Devera. Over to you, RV. Thank you, Ida. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm RV Devera, a proud union banker and now co founder and CEO of Union Digital. Union Bank Vice Chairman and now also Union Digital Chairman, Dr. Justo Aboitis Ortiz, has long spoken about Union Bank's aspiration to become a technology company and also a bank. With Union Digital, that is now a reality. Born natively digital, cloud only, branchless, paperless, and with no manual processes or legacy infrastructure systems, Union Digital will have the speed and agility of a FinTech, but with the governance and risk controls of a bank. Union Digital will continue to work in collaboration with the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, as we have so very well in the past, to help tech up the Philippines by leveraging new technological capabilities while harnessing the governance and risk expertise of a digitally transformed universal bank. But let me be very clear, Union Digital is not Union Bank. It is Union Bank moving at light speed. Union Digital is going to catapult Union Bank's digital transformation to its highest exponential degree. In this journey, we continue to see three key themes. These are FinTech, blockchain, and open finance. For FinTech, we've always had a FinTech first mindset. We are thought leaders in this space and have engaged our regulators here, namely the Banco Central and overseas with partners such as the Monetary Authority of Singapore on key matters to support the growth of the industry and drive inclusive prosperity. We deeply engaged fintechs by collaborating and co-creating with them, banking, enabling, synergizing, and eventually investing in them. As a result, Union Bank is now the fintech bank of choice. And we've successfully built the fastest growing fintech in Southeast Asia, UBX, which was also born from an initiative led by the fintech group, which I created. I am also a board director at UBX, which invests in fintechs and builds digital platforms. Next slide, please. Meanwhile, in blockchain, we have been natives in this space since 2014. We unveiled the first virtual currency ATM and created the first nationwide blockchain network connecting rural banks all over the country. Another global game changer is the Union Bank issued digital currency, PHX, an ERC-20 commercial bank backed digital currency. We also helped our Kababayans through blockchain enabled bonds PH with the Bureau of Treasury and piloted the first bank-to-bank cross-border remittance on the blockchain together with OCBC Bank at the Singapore FinTech Festival in 2019. All these global award-winning game-changing innovations approved by our very own forward-thinking Banco Central ng Pilipinas. Next slide, please. And last, next slide, please. <clears throat> 
And last but not least, open finance. We have always championed collaboration through open APIs and open finance. From union banks, API architecture to our globally award-winning API marketplace, the Netflix of APIs, you will always see us leading the way, even at the Monetary Authority of Singapore's APEX. We are both a FinTech, comfortable and innovative in this space. At the same time, we are also a BSP licensed digital bank, grounded on good governance and robust regulatory practices. In closing, Union Digital will harness these three key themes to deliver superior customer experiences. We will always be passionate about the customer and will tap Union Bank's natural ecosystems where we can unleash Union Digital and help tech up Filipinas. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, RV. Certainly, congratulations to you, by the way, being now the President and CEO of Union Digital. And congratulations to Union Bank to, and um, you guys, really, your game, game changers, really. Um, and I myself, I am actually also promoting the open finance. So thank you again. We'll get back to you, our, um, RV. For our third panelist, please welcome our very own MAP member and the founding president and co-CEO of GoTime, Mr. Elmer Jojo Malolos. Hi, um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, thanks, Ida, for, for that nice introduction. And it's good to see uh, familiar faces, uh, not only in the panel, but in the participants, uh, familiar names in the, in the participants. So I am uh, Giorgio Malolas. I'm the uh, founding CEO, uh, founding president and co-CEO of GoTime. Maybe we are uh, probably the name GoTime probably is the, the newest kid on the block, although um, we pride ourselves with uh, bringing forth a, um, uh, the ecosystem and the local ground presence of uh, JG Summit Holdings. And of course, the digital banking experience of um, Time Bank or Time Global out of South Africa. So in context, um, uh, this, this uh, participation and this uh, partnership actually brings forth to the country uh, an ecosystem that even without a digital banking infrastructure has already started working on uh, the BSP goal of uh, digitizing payments across its retail customers. And at the same time, also um, making sure that uh, um, stakeholders in the ecosystem of the JG Summit group are um, tracking the, the, the same type of uh, digital transformation journey that, uh, that the BSP is now advocating through uh, the digital bank, new digital bank framework. So technically the JG Summit Holdings uh, landscape or ecosystem is already a prototype of the 2023 vision of uh, BSP where 50% um, of retail transactions are digitized and about 70% of all of, of uh, our stakeholders are, are given accounts and session accounts, fostering responsible innovation and at the same time cyber resilience and um, across the conglomerate. So as an example, we, we, we take pride in having uh, Robinson's retail, a, biggest, uh, a big footprint, retail footprint, which will be, become the basis of uh, go, times, uh, go, go to market strategy, where we have about 8,000 shops capable of accepting all of these transactions uh, through, through uh, the hardware, through supermarkets. We also have partners, we also have URC, one of the biggest manufacturing companies uh, in the country uh, that prides itself of uh, being linked to about 150,000 retailers across the country. We have, of course, uh, our uh, property development footprint in RLC uh, that basically allows us to uh, partner with uh, almost 10,000 merchants who are uh, basically housed inside this um, uh, footprint. Uh, of course, our Cebu Pacific footprint, where we have about 17 million uh, customers. All of our stakeholders represent a good portion of the unbanked and underserved population that we are trying to target. We, uh, the JG Summit Holdings uh, ecosystem, presents a, an important sandbox by which we're able to introduce new products and services, as mentioned by the other digital banking players and uh, allow us to disintermediate and going straight to the buyer's buyer as um, BSP had advocated as well. 
And of course, uh, we are uh, partnering with a uh, very successful digital bank company called Time Bank out of South Africa, who basically prides itself with uh, being able to accumulate about 3.7 million customers in less than three years. And, then, uh, and also with approximately 60% of that base having uh, been active and on a 30 day, on a 30 day um, uh, rate, activity rate. They have also introduced new products and services that can be well introduced in the Philippines. And we uh, look forward to basically being able to give very, very good instance in the Philippines and being able to give a shot uh, at finally, finally addressing the uh, financial inclusion gap. So in ending, I don't have a, a, a presentation, but uh, this to us, to the, the JG group of companies and also to, to time, it's a very big opportunity uh, for us to collaborate, work with uh, uh, the BSP in providing and finally giving, shot, giving a shot at um, introducing uh, a new digital banking instance that will address the financial inclusion gap of the country. So thank you for giving us opportunity to present GoTime uh, in this first instance. And we look forward to uh, your questions, your clarifications, and uh, uh, look forward to a very productive uh, panel discussion today. Very, very nice. Um, Giorgio, seems, uh, Patrick, you wanted to say something? It seems like, it, okay. seems like it's, a, it's a digital bank to watch out for, because we have two big groups here. We have the JG Summit, and then we have the time. I'm looking forward to seeing your products, especially that your background is tech certainly a bank, bank to watch out for. Thank you again, Jojo. Uh, next up, our fourth panelist. Please welcome the president and the CEO of the country's first digital bank. And it had to had, it had to had, um, headed by a woman, I should say. A CEO overseas Filipino bank or OF bank, who is also Senior Vice President of the Land Bank of the Philippines. Another good friend, Ms. Laila Martin. Thank you everyone for having me today. Thank you also, Ida, and thank you to MAP for giving me the opportunity to present and discuss the uh, OF Bank and its products and services. The OF Bank acquired its digital bank license in March this year. It is the official digital bank of the Philippine government and is a 100% owned subsidiary of the Land Bank of the Philippines, the second largest bank in the country today. The OF Bank represents the fulfillment of a 2016 presidential campaign promise of the president to establish a policy bank that will cater to the needs of overseas Filipinos and their beneficiaries as well. And in the midst of a global pandemic, that promise became a reality on June 29, 2020, when we virtually launched OF Bank alongside our improved and redesigned online communication channels. As of now, we are operating as a digital bank. To date, our digital reach spans 116 countries. We have onboarded clients, both domestic and international, including those in the top 10 destinations for the deployment of OFWs. Let me go to our products and services. Our major uh, products include the digital onboarding system with artificial intelligence, essentially a mobile banking deposit account opening facility on supported iPhone or Android devices enabled with image recognition technology for the capture and upload of facial image and identification ID card. Account opening can be done in five minutes or less. Available as well in our MBA is access to loan facilities, the Pabahay Para Sa Bagong Bayani, a housing loan program, the OFW reintegration program, and the multipurpose salary loan. Fund transfer facility is likewise available with transactions between OF Bank and Land Bank accounts free of charge, while those between uh, OF Bank and other banks are subject to applicable Instapay or Pesonet charges. Customers can also do bills payment to more than 700 government and private merchants. 
Also through the OF Bank mobile banking app, overseas Filipinos, beneficiaries, and all other Filipinos are able to directly invest in the Philippines through the purchase of government securities, which can be completed again using your own mobile phones in five minutes or less. We have the premium bonds, uh, which requires minimum of only 500 peso investment with the opportunity to win cash and other prices in quarterly and annual draws. We also have the retail treasury bonds on boarded in the facility, minimum of 5,000. And of course, the most recent, which was launched only last September 15, the retail dollar bonds with a minimum investment of $300. Moving forward, OF Bank will also offer unit investment trust fund, run a collection platform for global Pinoy's contributions and payments to more government agencies and continue to strengthen our dealers and the merchants ecosystem. At this point, let me enjoin everyone to try the OF Bank mobile banking app, open an account online and be with us in adapting to digital change. A pleasant uh, good noon to everyone again. Thank you, Ida. Thank you. Thank you, Laila. Excellent. You know what? Because it's the first digital bank I actually opened. So there you go. And I'm quite impressed you. with your app. Very well thought of. You can even do RTBs and that, um, investments on that one. So excellent. Um, all right. We have, thank you again, Laila. We have now, let me see, our fifth panelist. Please welcome the country president of Tonic Bank, Ms. Maria Lourdes Jocelyn Long Pineda. Over to you, Long. Hi, Ida. Thank you very much uh, to MAP for organizing this webinar. And uh, welcome to all of the participants in today's uh, event. I'd like to introduce you Tonic Bank. Tonic is a um, native digital bank from conception to inception. We've been built on a platform that's purely digital. And we had that rare opportunity of starting our operation in the middle of the pandemic. So we actually launched commercially. I guess we must be the first bank to actually do a digital uh, launch of a bank, uh, which we did on March uh, of 2021 uh, of this year. And we're happy to share with our friends out there that at Tonic, we aim to be the bank where you dream big and save even bigger. And we also would like to make sure that we take away the pain points that a lot of people have with opening accounts with traditional banks at Tonic. You are able to open an account in less than five minutes. And also, you can actually open an account without even depositing any money yet, unlike uh, more traditional banks where you do need to have uh, a minimum amount in order to open your account. We are also, um, we have also uh, set ourselves to be a retail bank. We are more focused on the retail market, on consumer lending, and through our unique deposit products, particularly our stashes, we have actually designed these products to bring, give back control to our customers over how they want their money to grow. So we have allowed customers to set aside money for whatever um, items or whatever plans they have for the future. Kind of similar to how a lot of us do what we call a paluagan. We're also happy to report to inform everybody that we also very recently launched our first uh, digital loan. It's called a quick loan and time to money from application to disbursement is 30 minutes. So we hope everybody out there will take a look at Tonic Digital Bank. We are the newbie in the group. Um, also happy to say that we are actually the very first privately owned all digital bank that uh, started operations in the Philippines. Similar to OF Bank, we are already operational. So thank you everybody. And I hope you enjoyed the rest of 
this afternoon session. Thank you. Thank you, Long. Um, again, I, I'm impressed with, with the Noah, with your ad I just saw a little while ago. So you can actually have those envelopes, but instead of the physical envelope, you have it in your, in your digital bag. Another yes. bag to watch out. I've actually, you, you've been quite aggressive. I've been seeing your, your rates there. They're high compared to any other banks locally when it comes to investments. So um, thank you again, Long. We have now our last, but not the least. Please welcome Shalesh Bedwan, who is actually the president of Voyager Innovations and Paymaya Philippines, who is today representing our sixth digital bank, the Maya Bank. Over to you, Shalesh. SB, I should call you SB. <laughs> I'm more used to SB. Correct, Tira. Thank you. I was wondering who we were talking about for a minute over there. Uh, so yes, my name is Sharesh Badwan, but everybody calls me SB. Uh, I am the president of Voyage and Paymaya and a director of Maya Bank. So we are very happy to be here as the newest recipient of the digital bank license from the BSP. Uh, Maya Bank represents the next stage of our journey at Voyager and Paymaya. Now we know that Convenience and accessibility are the top drivers for mobile wallets, for digital wallets. While bank evokes a deep sense of security and safety in consumers' mind. And in the coming months, we'll be able to offer this combined unparalleled value proposition with Maya Bank in tandem with PayMaya. Now, just by way of a quick background, uh, PayMaya is the only end-to-end -end digital FinServe platform serving both consumers and enterprises whether they are online or whether they are physical on ground. We have our PayMaya wallet, which, which you're well aware of. We also have a very large payment processing business where we help merchants online, offline, MSMEs to very large players. And of course, we have our on-ground remittance network, our smart partner network. So think of us, uh, if you are from outside, as a kind of PayPal plus a remitly of the Philippines who we are currently as PayMaya. Now, Maya Bank is the natural extension for our journey to provide financial services beyond payments. Uh, we have 40 million registered consumers today across our, our network. We, we power over 250,000 acceptance points for merchants for payments acceptance. And our on-ground network of nearly 60,000 smart partner agents covers 92% of the cities and municipalities across the Philippines. So we have been at the forefront of enabling millions of consumers to do their first ever digital payment. We have enabled hundreds of thousands of small merchants, even some of the largest merchants to accept their first ever digital payment. And of course, millions to send and receive their first remittance across the length and breadth of the country. So we want to take the deep insight and trust that we have built with Filipinos to provide the next set of intuitive, transparent, accessible, and most importantly, trusted digital financial services to what I'd say the underbanked and also called the unhappily banked, both consumers and MSMEs in particular. So we're extremely excited to work towards the launch of Maya Bank. Uh, we believe that we will play a, a big role in helping to leapfrog financial inclusion by combining speed, innovation with our deep knowledge of the market. So it is a pleasure to be part of this select group of digital banks uh, pioneering uh, new paths in the Philippines. So great to be here. Thank you. And over to you, Ida. Thank you. Thank you, SB. You know, I, I've been saying that before. It's actually easier for PayMaya to be a digital bank um, compared to the typical bank or the traditional bank going into digital simply because of the legacy systems. And um, I wasn't surprised when PayMaya is actually one of us and here in, in the digital banking space. Thank um, you. I'm sure, I'm sure you guys, another digital bank to watch out for. Thank you. Uh, Patrick, may I continue? And it's now with our governor. Yes. Okay. With <clears throat> eagerness, it is my pleasure to call on our keynote speaker who needs no introduction. Please welcome the governor of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, Governor Benjamin Ben Jocno. Pleasant day to everyone. And thank you for inviting me to speak at this webinar entitled, The Rise of Challenger Banks. 
Indeed, this event by the Management Association of the Philippines is an excellent opportunity to collaborate and see the digital revolution from different perspectives. But first, allow me to share with you the country's digital payments landscape based on the 2019 update and 2020 preview on Philippine digital payments conducted by the Better Than Cas Alliance or BTCA in partnership with the BSP. In terms of the total volume and payments in the country, 70% were made digitally in the first half of 2020, as compared with 10% in 2018. Consumer payments make up 78% of the 4.6 billion monthly payments, followed by corporate payments at 21%. Consistent with the previous diagnostics, the government continues to lead the way in digitalization with some 87% or 319 billion equivalent of payments by the government's G2X already in digital form, up from 64% in 2018. The same is followed by payments made by people, P2X, and businesses, B2X, at 35% and 15% respectively. Noteworthy is the rise in volume of digital merchant payments by 66% since 2018. Essentially, this increase pushed the strong upward trend in the overall volume of merchant payments, driven by electronic fund transfers and the heightened use of prepaid cards. As you know, the BSP launched that in 2020, the Digital Payments Transformation Roadmap, a blueprint for the development of an efficient, inclusive, safe, and secure digital payments ecosystem that supports the diverse needs and capabilities of individuals and firms alike. In this journey, two strategic outcomes are emphasized. First is our goal to convert at least 50% of the total volume of retail payments into digital form. And second is to make available, varied, innovative and responsive digital financial products and services. The roadmap also aims to onboard at least 70% of Filipino adults to the financial system through the ownership and use of a transaction account. Over time, the increased usage of transaction accounts will enable Filipinos to build financial profiles that further unlock access to more complex financial services. According to the World Bank article entitled Digital Financial Services, published in April 2020, access to affordable financial services is critical for poverty reduction and economic growth. Countries with deeper, more developed financial systems enjoy higher economic growth and larger reductions in poverty and income inequality. Fintech-enabled digital financial services, or DFS, has the potential to lower cost, increase speed, security, and transparency, and allow more for more tailored financial services that serve the poor at scale. DFS would also allow governments to provide welfare grants and other forms of financial assistance to vulnerable people in a fast and secure way. With the issuance of digital banking framework, the Philippines is a step closer to reaching its strategic outcomes. On our end, the BSP has long recognized the role of digital platforms in finding greater efficiency in the delivery of financial products and services. We also see the recent issuance of the digital banking framework as an integral building block in promoting and enabling regulatory environment that fosters responsible innovation, promotes cyber resilience, 
and contributes towards advancing the digitalization of the financial sector. As such, we established a specific classification for digital banks. Due to their digital-centric business model, the operation of these banks should be underpinned by sound digital governance, robust, secure, and resilient technolo technology infrastructure, and effective data management strategy and practices. This digital banking framework is particularly relevant as billions of people affected by the COVID-19 pandemic are driving a, what I call historic and dramatic shift in consumer behavior. That's according to the latest research from the Pricewaterhouse Cooper or PwC. The consulting and accounting firm's June 2021 Global Consumer Insights Pulse Survey reported a strong shift to online shopping as people were first confined by lockdowns and continued to work from home. Another significant finding from the report is that consumers do not think they'll go back to their old ways of shopping once the pandemic is over. This may change the business models of companies. This remarkable result is supported by a study conducted by Visa in the Philippines, which also showed that around 70% of Filipinos who use digital payment channels during the lockdown will likely continue to do so. To date, the Monetary Board has already approved the application of six, six banks. The Monetary Board approval refers to the first of three states licensing framework of the PSP on the establishment of digital banks. On March 25, 2021, the Monetary Board approved the first application, which is from the Overseas Filipino Bank, seeking to convert its banking license from a thrift bank to a digital bank. On June 3, 2021, the Monetary Board approved the applications of Tonic Bank, Tonic Digital Bank Incorporated for conversion of its rural banking license to a digital bank license. And also Uno Bank Incorporated for the establishment of an entirely new digital bank. On July 15, 2021, the Monetary Board approved the application of Union Digital Bank, a wholly owned subsidiary of Union Bank of the Philippines. On August 12, 2021, the Monetary Board also approved the application of Go Time Bank, a partnership between JG Summit Holdings and a South African banking group. And lastly, on September 16, 2021, the Monetary Board also approved the application of Maya Bank Incorporated, an affiliate of PLBT's Voyager Innovation Incorporated. Based on their profiles, these digital banks intend to serve the OFWs, the underserved, the unbank, and the mass market, but are open to venture into investments, insurance, and payment services to broaden their reach. On August 19, 2021, the BSP issued Memorandum Number M2021-046 which announced the closure of the application window for new digital banks, including converting banks after August 31, 2021. This is to closely monitor the digital bank's performance and contribution to the country's financial inclusion goals, impact on the banking system, and the level of competition. Following such announcements, until August 31, the BSP received nine applications for new players and existing banks. These are on top of the two digital bank applications which were under evaluation prior to the announcement. These nine applications are processed on a first come, first serve basis. 
The application documents are also assessed by the DSP for completeness and sufficiency against the document requirements and applicant banks compliance with the licensing criteria for the establishment of digital banks. Currently, with the recent approval of Maya Bank, only one digital bank license remains to be contested by nine aspirants. In any case, this new category is not without its unique challenges. Data privacy concerns, money laundering, and electronic frauds are among the issues that can undermine the confidence in this policy initiative. We therefore expect that the key stakeholders, particularly the financial institutions, to adopt adequate measures and controls to manage such risk. Foremost to quits is the conduct of an effective information campaign to ensure that customers are aware of the risk and how they can perform the transactions securely. I want to emphasize that consumers must be made aware of consumer protection mechanisms. On the other end of spectrum, other government agencies are also expected to collaborate and address the digital divide. It entails ensuring access to IT infrastructure by people from all walks of life to achieve inclusivity. Given all these developments, what does it mean for MAP? As the COVID-19 wrecked havoc and put every facet of life on a virtual standstill, MAP's theme for the 2021, the Great Reset, leading for the common good sets the tone on how we should act and face the reality head on. Along with this great reset is the rise of challenger banks that can change the game on how the brick and mortal banks deliver their products and services. Intuitively, these digital banks can be viewed by traditional banks as formidable contenders which can reduce their market share. But there are strong arguments for allowing the establishment of digital banks. First, it can usher prosperity and alleviate poverty. Second, it can advance financial inclusion as the new entrants can provide affordable financial services to the mass market. Third, it can nudge the incumbent Bank's digital transformation moves as a way of staying relevant and competitive. In all of this, it's the customers and the business community who will reap the benefits. More than the challenger banks, we believe that the journey of our BSP supervised financial institutions towards digital transformation is another equally important aspect that MAP members can draw inspirations from. In particular, the BSP publication entitled BSP Unbound, Central Banking and COVID-19 Pandemic in the Philippines, released last year, show that investing in the right technology and tools, involving all departments in developing this strategy and investing in staff training are the critical factors towards the success of digital transformation. In the same publication, we noted how the pandemic made our supervised electronic money issuers and virtual asset service providers realize the importance of introducing new products suitable to the new normal, strengthening business continuity framework and pursuing digitalization initiatives. Clearly, such way of thinking is also the gist of a Harvard Business Review article in 2020 that highlighted the importance of pivoting to business models conducive to short-term survival along with long-term resilience and growth. It emphasized the need for disintermediation by going directly to the buyer's buyer, supported by changes in marketing logistics and information technology 
particularly e-commerce platforms. In closing, let me stress that digital banking forms part of a bigger picture. For easier visualization, we can say that achieving inclusive digital finance is similar to establishing a sustainable community. Just like a community with its key establishments, inclusive digital finance is attained when its key pillars are deeply founded and strongly visible. On the part of the Banco Central, we are committed to establish the policy and regulatory environment that will enable innovations to flourish while ensuring that the controls and safeguards are in place. We also firmly recognize that innovation should not be stifled. They should be allowed to develop in an environment where the associated risks are understood and addressed and where there is a judicious and proportionate application of sound principles. Achieving all of this is not just the sole responsibility of the SP. We must espouse a whole of government approach, taking into consideration the multiplicity of players and multi-layered relationships among FinTech innovators and financial sector players in ensuring consistency and preventing regulatory arbitrage. Continuing engagement with industry players like MAP has been crucial in fostering a shared understanding of risk, a collective action towards financial inclusion goals and a consensus in market conduct expectations. The key has been to maintain an active multi-stakeholder collaboration. Now, how does digital banking form part of this picture? Indeed, just like an automobile bringing its passengers to their desired destinations, digital banking framework, along with other mobilizers, such as Open Finance and Filsys ID, contributes to transporting the country to deeper financial inclusion and to move us closer to a well-managed financial system in the Philippines. We are living in exciting times and we all have a role to play. Let this initiative be just one of many more opportunities for us to work together to truly provide better ways of serving our constituents. With our vast network, we hope that this presentation be the starting point of another meaningful initiative. Thank you and a pleasant day to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Governor. Governor, you can still stay a little while, right? If yes, we can. Yes, of thank you. Thank you. Yeah, can I you. request, yes, can, can I please request um, the digital banks to open their videos uh, to uh, join us? We, we're going to have a QA with the Governor, and um, you may wish to also uh, chime in. Um, Governor, you've, you've taken a lot of, you know, a lot of points um, in that such short presentation. You put it in about the digital uh, journey and um, the financial inclusion, which of course, uh, at the end of the day, it's poverty alleviation. Um, and a, a few are actually texting me saying, hey, can we have your presentation? Um, we will be providing the presentation material of Governor Jokno. Governor, may I, may I talk about the elephant in the room? And in fact, someone already asked ask of this. Who is the seventh and why do we limit only to seven digital banks? Well, the monetary board decided to limit it to seven because we feel that we need to closely monitor this, this new technology, the digital banks. And also we want to, to find out their contribution to, to the economy and also how it will impact on the competition among, among uh, existing banks. You know, there are already something, something like 540 banks in the Philippines, right? Around 47 universal commercial banks, 48 uh, thrift banks, and uh, the rest are rural banks and, uh, and uh, cooperative banks. So 
we feel that I think there's just too many. And of course, given that this is a new, entirely new category of banks, we would like to monitor it very closely. So we limit it seven. Understand. So it's kind of similar to a sandbox. We're kind of pilot testing it at this point. And if it's actually quite successful, then we, um, so it's really not, this is a temporary limit. And, and somehow the other banks, the remaining eight who will not be able to get their applications, um, they can still have that chance in the future. Is that and, correct? And, and of course, the existing banks can do some form of digital banking also, right? There are some banks which, are, which have been very well developed for digital units, but they cannot call themselves digital banks because it's not from one end to another, right? These are what we call digital banks only for those which will be from one end to another, purely digital. They don't have branch, branch offices, whether light or the well-developed brick, uh, brick and mortar branches, but because that's one characteristic of a digital bank. There's no physical branch or sub branch or branch like unit. All they have to do is have the headquarters. That's it for a digital bank. But the, the existing banks, they can continue to do their uh, digital uh, transactions. And there are some banks that are already developing their own digital units. Okay. I suppose at this point, Governor, um, you cannot yet advise us who's going to be the seventh. At, at this point, I understand that's being checked out at the, at the moment, the application. Yeah, we, uh, we closely monitor the completeness of their uh, application, but it will be announced soon, the seventh. Uh, so it's, it's anyone's Seventh game. out of the nine, right? Okay. Right. Although, uh, well, I, I have the list, but I don't think I should mention it. Okay. Yes. okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, another question, um, and this is actually uh, uh, texted to us. Um, a lot of banks are already accessible digitally. Why the need to have a separate law, i.e. this digital bank? Yeah, of course, I, that's what I mentioned that, for example, ING, I think it's, uh, it is uh, in, in that nature. There are some other banks which are more or less digital, but we, 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 the monetary board decided that we should have a separate category, but they should be, that will be, they will be subject to the same uh, prudential restrictions that we impose on other banks, right? So the same uh, governance, uh, ex except that this, this kind of banks will have to have a, a, a stronger IT uh, character. For example, we require that they one of their directors should have a background in IT or e-commerce and one of their senior officers should have a background in, in e IT or e-commerce. The capitalization requirement is uh, is is not uh, uh, it's not uh, cannot it's, it's not uh, trivial. It's one billion pesos to be a digital bank, and we give them. Uh, this is part of a this uh, framework is just the start. Okay, we give them three years to to actually operate as a digital bank. Some of the banks are already, I think, they're raring raring to go. They they maybe I think in a less than a year, they will be off and running. In fact, some of them are already off and running. Okay, okay thank you for that, Gov. Um, there's a question here by Anonymous. It says here, is there a timeline to reopen digital bank license application? There's no timeline, but maybe we will assess this on a yearly basis, whether there's a need for one, for one for a need to reopen. So uh, there's no timeline. We can open it within a year, two years, three years, okay? Depending on the evaluation of the staff. Okay, there's another question here. Patrick, I'm wondering, do you have any question for Gov? One more question. Uh, <laughs> if you have any. Okay. okay. And um, again, any of our uh, digital bankers can chime in if you wish. Uh, Gov, another one. Um, digital banks have a considerable dependency on operators of payment systems for cash in and deposit enabling. Most are constrained to pass on the cost to consumers. 
given OPS are also under BSP supervision, are there any plans from the BSP to help regulate service cost, ultimately benefiting consumers? Of course, we, we try to, uh, just, just like our uh, payment system, we, we put, put a limit to how much the, uh, the uh, establishment or the, uh, the BSP supervised institution can charge. So now, for example, Instapay and the, and personnel, right? So we, we, will, we will impose limits on, on how much they can charge also. Okay, and I suppose for the digital bankers or the digital banks, it, um, for competitiveness, of course, you need to also watch sure. out your fees. Correct, yeah. you cannot, uh, because of the competition, you cannot set a very high price. All right. I was actually looking and I think OF Bank is quite competitive in terms of the fee structure. All right, okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, uh, God, before you, uh, is it time for you to leave? Because if we can have a photo op, and yeah, maybe okay, one, of course, of course. one more question, if we can. Is, is, do we have time for one more question? One more question. One more question. Um, the Ondoy anniversary was just a few days ago. Reminds us that the Philippines, prone to natural calamity, what's the backup of digital banks for transactions if there's no power uh, to open computers? Actually, no, Gov, you know, we can ask this to the digital bankers. So we, can't, we, we won't waste your time with this one. And I know you're in a hurry. Um, at this point, may I ask also attorney Cesar Villanueva to join us in the photo walk? Thank you, attorney Cesar. Can you open your video as well? And if we can have a photo op together with, of course, Longs, SB, Laila, Manish, Jojo, RV, and of course, Patrick. Here we go. One, two, three, if Matt can. Take the picture. Uh, Joanna, please. One, two. Another one, please. One, two. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Excellent. Um, can we have a virtual round of applause, please? Thank you, BSP Governor, for gracing our event. We hope to catch you and perhaps there may be a part two of this session because we still have uh, a lot of people are actually asking questions here, but we will see um, the changes here when it comes to the digital banking. And thank you for, for um, having quite an aggressive, you know, we, we're uh, one of the best, is particularly in Southeast Asia, when it comes to the openness of the regulators, particularly the Banco Central. So thank you so much, Governor. Um, on thank behalf you. of keep safe, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's good that we were able to actually get governor in such a uh, short time frame. Um, now we're having now the much awaited Q and A of our digital bankers here. So I want to ask a question here. I think this is from yes. uh, Ray Fernand San Pedro uh, from I think it's a Cryptable Bank. How do you ensure that KYC or know your customer is still observed upon onboarding? So I. Noticed one of the presentations showed uh, where they show uh, uh, visual recognition software, but um, what would be the other ways that, that uh, you do KYC? Can we ask the different banks about this when I'm opening an account with them? So who wants to um, tackle yeah. that one? Yeah, Go ahead. Ida, can I, yeah. can I chime in on this? Uh, I guess it's basically Lila and myself because we're the ones that are already operational. Okay, aside from uh, simply just like taking the photo of the person, uh, we also have at the back end for Tonic, we do have a, uh, a system at the back end that actually checks against AML while the person is onboarding. Uh, we are able to do uh, face deduplication. Like we can tell if the person's face and his ID, if it's the same person, we don't really, like Filipinos are so used to doing selfies. Uh, we just have to disabuse people's minds that when you do a facial recognition on, an, on a mobile app, it's not a selfie. It's really taking a look at points in your face to be able to establish if it is a real person who's there, it's a photo, or if that person's, uh, that person's ID corresponds to the face that's on the app. So while the person is onboarding on the back end, there's AML check going on. 
Uh, there's phase the duplication. There are several KYC checks that go on in the background. And I'm pretty sure our other uh, digital banks here uh, are aware that the BSP has actually issued a circular allowing for basic deposit accounts, which have the minim the most uh, the the minimalist uh, requirement in terms of uh, documents. It's basically just your face and a mobile number for digital bank. And you can onboard. Okay, so re indeed, it's a quicker onboarding when it comes to the digital yes. banks. Yes. You know, yes. If, if, I, if I may add, so my my view this on this is that, that there are two sides to it. While we have technology which is improving by the day, by the hour actually, which is allowing the K KYC and everything which uh, which Laila and uh, Long mentioned, uh, but at the same time. The, the advancements from regulators is also a very important part and where BSP has taken two very important initiatives, one in terms of the basic account, which I think, which I also saw in the responses, which allow a very easy kind of onboarding. And I believe the uh, universal ID, the single ID, uh, once that is fully operational in Philippines, that would be a big game changer. So imagine you have technology on one side, and then, then if you have even 70, 80% of the population or 90% of the population ultimately covered under the single ID, uh, that, that, that will be a kind of an exponential growth uh, to this in inclusion. Yep. Yes, Ida. Yes, go ahead, um, Yeah. Uh, at OF Bank, on the front end, we employ the face tech technology, which uh, as, as Long mentioned, what is, it does is to match the uh, face points, that what, what we call it, uh, of the selfie taken and uploaded versus the image of the ID uploaded. It's also capable of optical character recognition or the OCR to validate the details as encoded by the client. At the back end, uh, yes, we run all applications or uh, account opening in our AML, facility that automatically trigger whether it's a high risk or low risk client as uh, mandated by the Banco Central. The, the back end is also equipped with all the regular regulatory checkings uh, as required of a digital bank. Uh, back to you, Ida. Thank you, thank you. Okay, um, we still have some Q&A here, Patrick, if I may just ask, these are advanced questions that have been yeah. um, provided to us. Um, there are three banks here. You have main bank subsidiaries. You have OF Bank, you have Land Bank, Union Digital, you have Union Bank, GoTime, you have Robinson's Bank and Time. Aren't you competing with your own traditional bank? I mean, what makes you different? What's your edge? Can I start first with RV? Hi, Ida, can you hear me? Yes, very clear, thank you. Uh, so yeah, let me just, I'll answer that, but let me chime in the previous discussion um, because I think that's very important. So you, at Union Bank, we actually pioneered uh, digital account opening. We were the first bank to get BSP approval for a completely digital account opening procedure. We introduced selfie banking long before it was popular. Um, and as, as, as Long mentioned, it's now, it's now liveliness check really rather than a selfie. And it's nice that Filipinos like to take selfies. But those are things that we've been pioneering long before. And moving forward, remember that the BSP regulation, really, this all replaces face-to-face, -face, which was previously the, the primary method of KYC. I see Ida, I see her ID, and I'm confirming with my eyes. All of that is now replaced by technology, which is much better than the human eye. No? But that said, I think the, the, what Manish mentioned, the national ID, and even our own databases, the algorithm is to get smarter at recognizing RV de Vera over time and, and all that. So it's very important for us to build this database of, of identity and KYC. And I think at the end, it's a shared KYC through a national ID that will help improve uh, KYC, which is obviously the first hurdle now. And then that said, to answer the question about friction, um, and I think Ms. Leila and I had a nice conversation about this in the preparation, man. We're talking about existing with our, with, our, with our incumbents. First of all, let me say that there's no way you exist if you have friction with the incumbent. We are a product of the incumbent. We are the learnings of the incumbent. And so we are 
actually we are the incumbent on steroid and at lightning speed. So it has to be a harmonious relationship and that's the building blocks of this. So it starts from that advantage rather than a disadvantage of, of friction. Excellent. Uh, what about you, Laila? What's yeah, your take? I, yes, I think either um, digital cohabitation or digital cooperation is the key. Uh, OF Bank complements Land Bank's business as OF Bank caters to geographical or population segments not covered by the parent bank. And I totally agree with that uh, uh, position of RB uh, in this case. We don't compete. We don't uh, get to have friction with the parent bank because we can cohabitate the digital space and we can cooperate more with each other so that we can have more financial inclusivity in digital space. Because basically you're saying this is a big pie anyway, and, and therefore yes. you can actually, yeah, it's a huge pie to, to cover that, that uh, target from 50 to 70 and hopefully eventually 100% uh, financial inclusion. Um, Long, what's your take on this? Uh, I'm sorry, it's not long. It's go. <laughs> it's Jojo. Jojo. Yeah. Well, uh, I think I think. Uh, well, I also answer the, the the question on KYC first because I I, I thought that uh, yes, please. Uh, our instance and with 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 time bank uh, probably also allows us to appreciate that uh, we can maximize responsible innovation through eKYC. I think everybody can be can have access to the best of the game changers relative to eKYC. But I think. Uh, um, the, the process of bringing this to the people, uh, particularly the unbanked, particularly the masses uh, and, and the underserved, uh, is, is, is also a very, very critical consideration. And that's where, as um, mentioned earlier, uh, the regulation can, can come in, right? So there has to be a very important aspect of the unbanked really wanting to have an account. It's not just, you know, you're selling something to them. They have to find a way by which they like it. And so... Part of our approach is really to bring EKYC to the people. Um, that's why we, we, we are incorporating our kiosks. You know, we have mobile kiosks, we have kiosks where people would normally uh, go to and then facilitate for them, for those people who are not able to get the EKYC via the app, maybe because of you know, technology, uh, because they, you know, they're, not, they're not comfortable do, doing their EKYC on their smartphone. We have, uh, we, we have facilities by which we can do that on, on the ground. But again, the important thing there is that everybody will have an access to the, the very game-changing innovation on EKYC. It's really a matter of how you uh, execute and, and, and uh, bring, them, bring them to the, to the unbanked or the customers that you want to have. The second question is really interesting because, uh, yeah, we have, we have Robinson's Bank and, and to your point, Ida, the pie is so huge. I mean, the enemy here is not each other. The enemy here is not the enemy here is poverty, right? The ability to get people use use this technology, so that people are able to uh, you know uh, use it to to improve their lives, improve their you know have livelihoods that can allow them to prosper. You know? um, and again, with with Robinson's Bank, uh, Robinson's Bank, and and the rest of all the other commercial banks have existed for a while, and yet we still have seventy percent of the people unbanked, right? So. I think collaboration is key. We coexist. And in fact, uh, Robinson's Bank is uh, one of the founding shareholders of, of, of GoTime. And, uh, and that basically exemplifies our intention to maximize whatever it is that they have set up already and allow GoTime to, to take off from that infrastructure that they have set up. But at the same time, um, coexist to expand it further using, using innovations and, and technology that probably um, they cannot use, not, not because they're not capable of, but because, you know, the infrastructure that's been provided to them to take care of is, is, is larger than, than the, uh, that will allow them to move in a more agile way. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chocho. Very well explained. Um, okay, given the trust and as we're talking, uh, Chocho did mention about the financial inclusion and, and the big pie, how about the three other digital banks. How can you contribute to that? Can I start with you, Manish? Uh, Manish, you're on mute. Thanks. Let, let me start with some global numbers, which I'm sure everyone's heard, but, but there's a point which I'm trying to make. Like, if you see today, there is 1.7 billion people which are still unbanked. 
And whereas the first bank globally was set up 550 years back. So that's still 20 to 25 percent of the global population which is unbanked. So there, there were genuine reasons for it. There, there was issues around accessibility, technology, about identification, about kind of cost of onboarding every every customer because the banks can't can't kind of run losses. But the huge amount of change has happened over the last five or 10 years with the advent of technology and specifically in the last two years with again, COVID, which kind of pushed us to kind of really think and innovate uh, all across the entire ecosystem to innovate, to kind of bring the cost lower. So I believe all of us are in, in a kind of a cusp of an humongous opportunity. They say big trends come in 20 years. 30 years. This is this is an opportunity to kind of change this game for for good, and not only us. I think I think every bank, every of my my co fellow digital bankers here are all. Everyone's going to contribute to this this system. But specifically talking about Uno, we want to do two things, and I touched upon it earlier during during the introduction. One is uh, overall, of course, through use of technology. Whereas there is no minimum deposit balance, make sure that there is no parameters for issuing a issuing a card. Leverage technology, uh, construct it smartly so that you are able to kind of reach out to as many people as as possible and get them into the net. Because it's not only really about opening an account; it's also about being able to sustain. Uh, more. That's that's where the challenge comes in. The second is where we think we will definitely, or we are convinced, we have a very differentiated positioning again, as of now, but there is room for three or four or five players is around the entire spectrum of consumer credit. Because we, we financial inclusion does not need to happen only from the bank accounts. Even when you try to bring people in into the organized sector of lending, by default, they come into the financial inclusion umbrella. Anyone who's borrowing can be complemented with a, with a bank loan. So and I shared some numbers earlier, but we, we all know that uh, Philippines consumer credit penetration is one of the lowest in, in the region. And UNO's strategy from day one is to kind of target mass and mass affluent and, and really try to make a bend and, and use all our lending experience of the management team, uh, use the experiences which we have had in our previous organizations, use, use the alternate uh, data, use the technology and kind of put a proposition where we are able to kind of turn around and take a lead uh, in this space. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Manish. That's quite thorough. You know, I've been, we've been discussing about Philippines, but in fact, the world is, is huge. It's not just um, Philippines. And and um, as you mentioned, it's not just the banking part, which is the, the access to savings and deposits. It's, it's access to loans as well. Thank you for that, Manish. Um, uh, Long, please, your take on this. Okay. Um, well, uh, compared to, you know, to uh, RV and Jojo and Ida, we actually don't have a legacy bank behind us. So we actually um, started as a purely digital bank from the ground up. Now, I agree with, uh, with Manish that uh, there is really a big pie to work with. And as you know, BSPS also told us that we have something like 70 million under bank or uh, unbanked Filipinos and getting them into the formal banking sector is really important. But I do agree that for digital banks to really be able to survive and be sustainable, they need to monetize whatever deposits they're able to uh, mobilize, which means they need to go into lending. And similar to what Manish said, I do agree that uh, there is a huge consumer lending market in the Philippines. Um, our initial studies that we did when we were starting the the study on uh, Tonic Bank back in 2019, was you're looking at something like $13 billion for consumer lending in the Philippines. So that is largely on top. Um, a lot of people would like to have access to, to financial services, particularly loans, but because of certain pain points uh, in dealing with traditional banks, that's something that has been a bit difficult, particularly for the underbank segment. So 
us digital banks need to be able to address that. And uh, we need, using our digital platforms, we need to be able to establish you know, capacity to pay, uh, character, all of the usual C's of credit, but on a digital platform. So which means the use of alternative scores, the use of big data would be critical for doing this. Social media, along. Yeah. Oh, by the way, on social media, uh, the governor mentioned earlier that one of the things that we need, that we digital banks need to prepare for, is like uh, information campaigns. And he, all, I also noticed in one of his slides, the topmost uh, box was on data privacy. This is one thing I noticed about Filipinos in the Philippines. They have this penchant for sharing everything on social media. So it's really up to us digital, digital banks to kind of uh, educate them and tell them, please don't post on social media your account number or you know, yeah. bragging because I have this much yeah. money in my account. We actually need you know, to be actively informing them that they're opening themselves up to you know, po potential fraudsters or hackers. So I think that's part of what we digital bankers really need to do to educate uh, our customers, particularly on using the, a digital platform. Yeah, nice point, because it can lead to fraud. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, also for uh, KYC, do you use also social media for knowing your customer or to, uh, there's a question here from Marcy Kochetua. Do you use social media activity of the loan applicants as part of the credit decision making? So, uh, um, perhaps, oh yeah, go maybe ahead. That, maybe uh, go maybe ahead. Lila would like to respond oh, to that. Uh, okay. Yeah, um, Lila. At present, no, we're not using social media as a gauge for uh, credit assessment. Not at this point. Uh, as far as Tonic is uh, goes with in terms of our uh, credit underwriting process and decision making, yes. We do use information on social media. Um, sorry, I cannot share more detail on that, but suffice it to say that that does play a big role in terms of the scoring. Uh, we have three different scores that are running on the back end when the person uh, you know, on boards and applies for a loan. Okay, I better control my social media posts. <laughs> it's part and parcel of social credit rating now. Um, yeah, I, I want to go back. I, I, I have not asked uh, Manish yet. I, I beg your pardon. SB, that same question with regards to the financial inclusion. You know, because Pay Maya is already there. So now there's Maya Bank. So SB, could you expand on that one? Yeah, no, sure. Absolutely. Like you said, uh, Ida, for us, the digital license, bank license from my bank is really unlocking the next stage of our mission that we are on, on financial inclusion at Voyager and PayMaya. So it's very much uh, a natural progression, so as to say. We are totally digitally native uh, as a company and financial inclusion is what we do. So for us to leverage the unique assets that we have today at PayMaya, and to use that in a way to accelerate the journey of Maya Bank. So over the years, you know, we have been relentless in breaking the barriers with instant account ownership and opening. Uh, and we've spoken about that at length. The whole digital payment adoption through the wallet, e-wallet, the on-ground uh, you know, acceptance of digital payments. So today, when we look at our network, you know, 40 million consumers who are sending money, buying online goods and services, paying their bills, uh, are doing digital financial transactions, a lot of them for the first time ever uh, using PayMaya. So these customers are absolutely ready for the next stage of digital banking. Uh, similarly, on the merchant side of the house, uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, MSMEs and SMEs that we're helping to accept digital transactions. So these merchants are, again, absolutely ready for digital banking. And uh, last but not the least, even our agent network on the ground, uh, you know, who are there to the Sari Sari stores, uh, small business owners, they are very much ready to take their journey of, uh, of their digital banking. I think what's really interesting to me, what we are seeing is that, you know, consumers who have come in for the first time, so you can imagine their frankly journey has been pretty fantastic by virtue of getting onto e-wallets. The journey is pretty frictionless from onboarding through usage. And this is their first financial experience that they're having. And it's a pretty good financial experience of, of the whole process end to end. 
It's intuitive, it's accessible. Uh, it is based on data and understanding that we have about them on which we tailor and continuously upgrade products and serve up to them new offers. Uh, and these consumers are also using today the best in class digital assets for entertainment and for all their other needs, uh, social media we spoke about. So I think the expectation of these consumers in terms of being able to deliver products and financial products in terms of the next stage of banking is going to be a very high bar. Uh, you know, I think the, the UI, UX, and, and they expect you to, to understand what their needs are and serve them relevant products. So I think we're entering a really interesting phase, not just to include them, but you know, how we will include them with, with products that are absolutely feel like designed for them and uh, in a way that, that's intuitive, accessible, easy, frictionless will be really, really critical. So we are very, very excited about using the expertise that we built up, the data that we have on the customers and using that really to start building out the next set of financial products. Thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, again, another excellent explanation. Um, I can actually compare. I have two EIS. One uh, started, you know, uh, banking, and, and then the other one didn't. Um, one was able to get a credit card already. And, um, in fact, one was able to even get a loan to buy a, a small property, and the other one hasn't. So that's actually the comparison when it comes to going digital. The more that you bank it in, um, especially digitally because it's easier. And of course, with this pandemic, it's it's um, contactless or uh, minimal contact. Yeah, that's a major plus point as well. Okay, moving on, there's a, there's a pending question here that I nearly failed to, to uh, continue to ask. And this would require me perhaps more of a tech person uh, among you uh, about the on the anniversary, you know, you, you lost power, you lost connection. So how? How can you, um, so the question here is, what is the backup of digital banks for transactions if you don't have power or neither connection to change or to charge smart cell phones or no internet connections during a calamity? Who, would, who wants to take this up? So, I mean, I can just reflect. I mean, we, we over here today, so like I said, length and breadth of the country, right? So we are already there. In length and breadth. So first of all, yes, you know, you have to build in redundancies and deep redundancies in the systems, right? You have to be able to do disaster cutovers because you may have a typhoon in a particular part, a volcano eruption. And so Philippines gets this more than its fair share of, of calamities that happens over here. Now, the, the, the two things that do happen pretty quickly is the, the telecom infrastructure is usually one of the first to come back in any natural calamity because it is just a basic connectivity point that is there. Uh, and all of us as digital bank, it's, it's electricity and it is telco that, that, that are the two kind of ingredients that you need over here. And those two, two tend to be the ones that come back fairly quickly. I think the rest of it is really incumbent upon us, the way we design our products and our apps. We're very, very careful about the size of the app, the consumption of power those apps do when they're operating on the mobile phone and the likes of that. So those are some core inherent design principles that you have to put in place to make sure that uh, that happens. And then the rest is, like I said, redundancy built in, but uh, you know, complete lack of power or, or a phone going dead completely and not having any power in it, uh, unfortunately that becomes fairly challenging to solve for. But what the consumers need to know is that we as, as, as operators will have redundancy, so it's all safe. And the second that they are able to get back on online in some shape or form, they will have quick very quick access. In fact, we will probably be one of the first ones that they can access and get to, right? Because there's no kind of physical infrastructure. We can help them start doing their transactions instantly the second they are online. So that's how, you know, we have worked and we've seen, uh, and that's where we got to be cognizant of how we design our products and how we serve them up to the customers. Okay. I, I'm, I'm hearing though, um, you know, kind of, sorry, part of the business continuity, what you can also do is have the convenience stores uh, tie up with you and they could kind of represent you. I, I understand that's part of the allowance uh, in the digital bank, uh, getting the digital bank license. That It's not a branch, but you can have um, partners that Agents, yeah. you can coordinate with. Uh, anyway, Jojo, you wanted to expand yeah. on this. I, I wanted to answer that question from a, not from a technical perspective because uh, it applies to everybody, even banks right now who are getting into digital, even Paymaya and Gcash, you know, they have the same problem, you know, what if there's a brownout in an area where you're, you're, you're most active? So 
So these are, you know, these are things that we cannot um, assure with certainty that it will not happen. And uh, as SB mentioned, uh, you know, we can only we can only try and maximize our ability to enhance the trust of our customers. You know, because sometimes I think the trust is really the issue on this. You know, when 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 somebody's trying to send uh, money and there's brown out and you know, or there's there's no network, normally. <laughs> They blame the operator, right? They blame they blame Paymaya. They will blame uh, GoTime because you know, they're they're not able to send money. So, I think the most important thing is uh, again to 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 the governor's pres um, presentation earlier is to um, you know increase the level of literacy of people about all of these things and uh, maximize information around the value of a digital account, the value of transferring money, the importance of making sure that, you know, there's proper uh, identification where you want to send it. And uh, the operator, the digital bank operator can only uh, basically, you know, make sure that, you know, there's redundancy, there's a continuity of operations, but in, more importantly, that the data you have on all of those transactions remains intact so that you know you equip your customer service team to be able to address all of those potential you know weak points or failure points of trust trust failure points as we call it and you know we whether whether it's all digital whether you're half digital and half uh, half physical this these problems will come in and it's it's actually the way you design your customer management your consumer protection uh, uh, policies and uh, initiatives that will actually help address that particular problem. Right. Thank you. Yeah. RV, yes, please go ahead. So I agree with, with all of that. And, and uh, what got me thinking was Yolanda and uh, Undoy. No? And, and I recall that that is a perfect instance when it's good to have a partner or a parent like Union Bank and the conglomerate's full breath because. Even in those times, I remember we used, you know, the Union Bank branches, the City Savings branches, the Pera Hub branches and counters, the physical network, which Union Bank has already. And because it is a universal bank in the physical world, digitally transformed, that relationship is something we can leverage on more than just an agency banking network, but really as a full-fledged conglomerate with a footprint nationwide. No? So I remember that because for Yolanda and Ondoy, uh, Things were down. We actually sent union bankers, city savings people on site, and they were they were there attending to customers uh, at the, as, as a worst case scenario. No, so so that comes to mind as a as a worst case scenario. But but that said, Jojo and the rest are, are absolutely right. The digital infrastructure has to be robust. It has backup. We're fortunate that one of our backups is obviously the parent, and the entire breadth and strength that the parent brings. Um, but that that said, we are still completely digital only, while Union Bank remains digital first. But thankfully, it has a huge physical footprint. Yeah, you seem to have the best of both worlds. So you, you have a, a big backup, but at the same time, you're digital only. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that, RV. Let's move on. Although this, this question is actually, this is the one that I was intending to, to read out for, um, for uh, Gov. Uh, but then again, I think he already answered as far as the seven license, why only seven? Someone's comparing about the population of Malaysia, 32 million versus 27 digital banks and only seven as far as Philippines at this point. I think he answered that already that you can still continue on and um, see that the role of the regulator is of course to balance it out on the risk and um, wait and see how these banks are going. Not yet a timeline to reopen, but it's something that if it's successful and, and undoubtedly by the way it looks, and the way that our audience, uh, even here in MAP, uh, like uh, about 500, some of them are in the uh, live in, in Facebook, uh, the fact that there's a interest on this, uh, undoubtedly is gonna uh, be expanded by BSP uh, sooner than later. So um, question. Okay, I wonder if you can, can answer this, although some of you have answered this already, and some of you are not yet operational, but how do each of the six banks plan to differ differentiate itself or yourself from consumer's mind? What's the unique value proposition you have you can offer? Um, let me start, Manish. Thanks, Ida. Uh, part of it I've already answered in my previous response. Yeah. So for Uno, 
broadly three things. One is, as I had mentioned earlier, that our tech is completely green tech. We are starting from scratch. So it is all about agility, scale up, and it is about making sure that the tech is such enabled that you have the ability to deliver an account and optimize cost. There's another question out on the, on the q and I was browsing through it and I'll probably answer that uh, in, in this connection, which was that how, how does tech enable financial inclusion? Shouldn't it be just the economic parameters? And, and why tech is important is having worked in a, in a traditional bank uh, before and uh, over the last two years, having looked at various different models, sometimes the issue of client acquisition is not the intention, but in, in many traditional banks, every new account which you onboard, there's an operational cost, there's a tech cost as high as $40 sometimes, which is 2000 peso, not to talk about the other operational costs and everything. So, so if you are able to bring that operational cost down and the tech cost down, and tech, tech cost is a part of the operational cost, one is able to really scale up. That's, that's definitely our, our focus. The second is our approach on hyper-personalization. Uh, again, it's not going to happen on day one, but our proposition is to have, have a tech build out or have a proposition which is not the same for everyone. It's just like your Netflix. If your Netflix is not the same as your brothers or your parents, if everyone sees something different out there. For someone who's struggling to make two ends meet and is borrowing, there's no point trying to show investment options to that person. And that's, that's not how we want to approach banking. We, we want to approach banking so that it is relevant. Like what, what is it that you, you require? Yeah. And the it's third is our entire positioning around, around credit as a lead. Though we are a full spectrum bank, and again, we will really offer the entire life cycle, which is safe, borrow, transact, protect, and invest, but we play a leadership role through, through consumer credit. Uh, and and that, that would definitely, we think, will put us into a kind of a unique uh, proposition. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Manish. Very thorough. Um, again, it boils down to customer experience. I wonder if the rest can actually reveal your edge, but eventually people will know about this anyhow. Um, I know Tonic has mentioned about the wallet in, in your ad. Um, anything else you want to add on, Long? Okay, um, one thing that's also um, slightly different in Tonic is uh, although we are a bank, we actually don't see ourselves as, uh, we don't see ourselves as a bank. We kind of say that we're similar to what uh, Jojo and RB were saying. We're FinTech, that's also a bank. Now, what we've done that's quite different is we've actually Filipinized the way our app works. So our app actually talks to the consumer. Um, and in fact, uh, when a person onboards on our app for the first time, after a successful onboarding, the person would get a message that says, welcome on board, Han. So Ooh. it's it's trying voice to Voice activated? Develop. Is it's, that voice it's activated? To, it's not, it, it appears on the app, but it's kind of trying to build that relationship uh, with the customer. So even the way we deal with our customers, we're very uh, proactive with them. We listen to our customers. We have a very active Facebook um, uh, account and we do, uh, you know, constantly communicate with our customers. We always try to make sure that whatever we offer, uh, whatever products we offer are, some, are things that are relevant to our customers. And as everybody here is going to be doing in the next couple of months, when you start launching, you're gonna get a lot of feedback, good and bad. And it's important for your customers to see that you do listen to them because a lot of customers think that their banks, the traditional banks don't listen. So it's important to develop that relationship because it keeps, uh, it maintains that stickiness that uh, customers will have with your bank. So um, we, when we started out, we were the newbie, okay? We didn't have uh, a parent bank that had a name recall. We were, you know, a name out of nowhere. People were in fact telling us, are you an alcoholic beverage? Because it's tonic. I said, no, 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 it's not gin and tonic guys. It's just tonic. But um, what we also decided to make us different was 
we even the way our app has been designed, it's not the way a traditional bank app looks like. So there's also a, a couple of unique features. Um, the app actually is very interactive. It speaks to whenever a person opens the app, it feels like the app is talking to him or to her. So I've had a couple of people like on Facebook saying, oh, I don't have love life right now, but at least there's somebody who calls me love or hug. That's tonic. <laughs> it's the digital assistant they can talk to. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah Long, so uh, basically what you're saying is you have an edge at the moment, but you continue to evolve in line with yes. what the customer is looking for. for. Yeah. Uh, Laila, could you um, tell us, although you've actually mentioned about your edge, but um, people seem to think this is only for for OFWs, do you want to expand on? Because I, I used it myself and you have one of the most merchants and uh, it's really a one-stop shop and um, great for investments. Um, anything else, Laila? Yeah, indeed, uh, Ida. When OF Bank was created based on the mandate of the EO 44, that, that was sometime 2017, the, the, the concept really is for OF Bank to market maintain and service overseas Filipinos, overseas Filipino workers and beneficiaries. But at present, uh, OF Bank has expanded uh, the market to which it's gonna be servicing uh, the, the digital banking products and services. Uh, we, we are uh, recently, the Department of Finance uh, officially um, nominated or designated OF Bank as the official uh, digital bank of the Philippine government. And we will soon be uh, coordinating with government agencies, onboarding their services in our MBA, having a, a suite of products and services that will allow uh, payments, contribution to any government agencies in the Philippines uh, from anyone, from any source for that matter. We are at present um, aggressively partnering with the uh, providers uh, espousing open banking. And of course, those that are right now onboarded in the national retail payment system so that we can capture more and provide more services. I think uh, another thing going for OF Bank is that our parent bank is the Land Bank of the Philippines. They have the financial muscle they have the robust technology to run and uh, probably provide us the resources to run a digital bank like OF Bank. And, and basically that trust. Uh, I think RB mentioned earlier about the trust. Uh, it's one of the critical factors in banking, be it traditional or digital banking at that. Uh, I think we can leverage on that trust that uh, consumers, the Filipinos now, have with the parent bank. And um, we, we can encourage more uh, Filipinos, uh, uh, domestic or internationally located, to leverage on that trust and the robustness of the technologies of, of uh, OF Bank. Of course, I have mentioned earlier, Ida, that we are well, we can onboard OFWs wherever they are, globally, wherever they are. Uh, we're running to 116 countries already and increasing at the moment. So, so I think, yes, being a policy bank has its fair share. And um, we, we intend to onboard more. We intend with, in collaboration with the parent bank to encourage more people, more Filipinos, uh, in the aspect of financial inclusiveness. Thank you, Ida. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Laila. You know, you just answered one of the questions here about the protection, of, uh, protection um, of our consumers, and basically, you said sovereign risk. Uh, you're backed up with the Land Bank of the Philippines, no? And I think that's a similar scenario as RV backed up by by the Union Bank. Um, uh, FYI, if I may answer this particular one, is they are a bank and it's licensed with. Banco Central ng Pilipinas, which means that there's also PDIC requirement, which is one of the requirement, and therefore, um, I, therefore there is protection. Um, so it falls within uh, the typical banking uh, industry requirements as well in terms of protection. 
Um, right. Who wants to chime in on, on that same question, please? Go ahead, Jojo. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, th I think the answer to the differentiation is not, not so much that I can differentiate myself with others, but uh, basically differentiate in such a way that we really tackle this holy grail of adoption, right? So, you know, this 70% unbanked has been, has been a holy grail for decades, right? So, um, uh, and, and, and so we, we, the go time is, is fortunate to have uh, two big uh, conglomerates or two companies that uh, at least, you know, gives us a uh, head start in terms of uh, identifying who would benefit from this uh, innovation. And we have the Gokongwei group uh, which basically has a huge uh, footprint across that 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 basically shares um, uh, the opportunity for us to continue to continue the legacy or the the objective of the Gokongwei Group in terms of servicing its uh, customers. In Robinsons Retail, we have four thousand stores uh, nationwide that caters to mostly unbanked, and we have about four thousand drug stores uh, that we have, uh, which basically also caters to most of these uh, customers. And then Universal Rubina is one of the biggest, you know, snack manufacturing company has 45 product brands, but at the same time also allows us to penetrate, uh, you know, the retailer network much, much better and provide for their requirements. Cebu Pacific has 22.3 passengers who are all also, you know, this, has been, this industry has been democratized. And we also have Robinson's Land Corporation, which has about 240, 230 properties, including, including uh, malls that have thousands and thousands of merchants. So, so we have this, we have this uh, uh, footprint by which we can continue what the Gokong Way has been doing in terms of providing consumers with better choices. Only now we're able to support that with innovation that probably will allow us to maximize adoption, right? So uh, we have data analytics that cuts across our millions and millions of customers, which we can use to basically identify who amongst these consumers probably will be able to uh, work with us and who can be customers to us and who will actually benefit from this innovation. And also we have the luxury of partnering with Time, which has experienced uh, doing this in an emerging market in South Africa and uh, being able to provide the right products and services and be recognized also by, by consumers for that. Even, even their competitors recognize them by giving them a really, really good uh, you know, uh, net promoter score. So we think that while this can be considered as differentiation, I think this, this basically all goes well with the objective of everybody, of the six banks or the seven, seven digital banks to, to finally really come up with a robust solution that, that this, you know, we will be able to bring down probably the, the level of uh, um, you know, unbanked maybe to 50% to 20%. And, and that can be a metric that probably uh, uh, BSP would like to take a look at. So, we look at this edge, we look at these capabilities, we look at this advantage as uh, allowing us maybe you know, a, a good level of comfort that we will be able to really, you know, really give, give financial inclusion a, a real shot. Yeah, certainly you do have an edge and having all of these um, partners, conglomerates, merchants, stores, especially actually that answers the earlier question of if there's no power and those are, um, uh, your conglomerates would be able to assist as well. Um, Shalish, uh, SB, um, anything to add? I know I think uh, a lot of the points that the panelists have said are absolutely spot on, but I think just reiterating a couple of those data, right? I mean, that goes at the heart of any financial institution, anybody being able to take any action. So for us, of course, that is a critical piece. We have data on millions of consumers who use us every day. Every day we get to know them even better and better as they do more transactions with us. There are hundreds of thousands of MSMEs who are using us on a daily basis and we get to know more and more about their needs. Uh, and you know we have to constantly iterate uh, our products and our services and our offerings. So, so the data is an extremely important part, right? Of understanding customers. The second I would say is trust. Uh, you know, you know that is that is not easy to establish if you know people in the section who have been financially excluded, and you know for them to part money, uh, it's not easy, right? So, so, so you have to have a very high level of trust that you've established. And I think by virtue of the fact that we have an on-ground network through our smart partner network, our wallet that they have used, uh, you know, millions they've done, you know, literally billions of pesos worth of transaction, hundreds of billions of worth of transactions. So they've seen that it works and it happens through calamities on a day-to-day -day basis, through it all. I think those are really critical. And last but not the least, we've touched upon the little bit of the kind of online to offline, right? So what we've been building is really a 
FinServe platform that connects consumers, enterprises, and that works online and offline. So today, for example, on our, our PayMaya wallet, you can walk up to our smart butler agent, put cash on the table, and he will instantly top up your wallet. Or if you have excess cash on the wallet that you need for uh, payments, you you know you can instantly cash out of the wallet and things like that. So so that ability of really being able to provide end to end, which can work uh, to to really create a sense of a end to end ecosystem for consumers uh, is is what is critical, and you know that's what we want to build on and in a natural evolution for them from saying, okay, you're already today doing a lot of transactions, you do the next. And there are different segments out there. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, you know, we see in the wallet, there's a whole gaming segment out there. So how do you talk to them in a different language? There are, you know, people who are very utility driven and who use you for basic things like bills payment and stuff. And then there are others who like, you know, other aspects. So, so there are lots of different sub segments within this. This is not one amorphous mass. And so, so to know, the details and to understand behind that customer profiles and, and developing that and building on that is important because customers do like to be served and treated as individuals. So that's where we believe, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of time and that's what we do day in and day out. So keep, keep doing more of that. Since um, uh, the Maya Bank or, and the PayMaya is doing a lot of an analytical uh, work here and you'd be able to actually progress in terms of that customer experience. Excellent, SB. Finally, RV, the, you, um, last but not the least on this one. Thanks, Ida. Um, I'm, you know, I was listening to everyone. It, it's encouraging to hear everyone talk about the customer. No? So, so for me, I think, I think you know, congratulations to all us digital bankers. We're talking about the customer first. Um, and then we're talking about financial inclusion second. So I think that that's, that's fantastic. Um, and, and that said, we've obviously put customer centricity at the center of, of, our, of our model. No? And if, in terms of differentiation, let me, let, me, let me add to that by saying that we've always obsessed with being more invisible as a bank, being an embedded experience, because we always believed, and that's what scared us in our digital transformation. We always felt that banks will die. You know, there will be no need for banks, but there will be need for banking. And, and that prompted us to think about being more embedded. So to do that, you have to have a few characteristics, such as you have to be you know, almost at the near marginal cost of zero. You have to have technology that allow you to do that at near real time, safe and secure. And when we looked around, a lot of the things we did around FinTech, around blockchain, and around open finance are learnings that we're going to harness and bring to the customer experience in Union Digital. I mean, to talk about SBs, data, data. I totally agree with you guys. That's going to be our biggest challenge here as digital bankers. Uh, the data of our customers, the threats around cybersecurity, and those are things we have to take care of, especially in an era of open finance. We're headed towards open banking and open finance, and that data is something you need to share. Um, and, and you know, the work that we've done at Union Bank for the past couple of years, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work, but there's still a lot of work to be done in this space as data becomes more freely shared with consent and then how do you secure that transferring across platforms? So with the BSP's open finance regulation in full force, when that takes into effect and that starts to, you start to see that as use cases, then we will all be challenged to make sure that we keep our standards high, our customers' data very secure, right? And all the transactions in between end-to-end -end very secure. So those are our responsibilities as we work towards financial inclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much, RV. Very well said, as, as always. So um, on top of helping the unbanked, which redounds the poverty allevi alleviation, uh, on top of actually doing that customer experience, it's been said that, that banks' survival rate is low if you don't convert to digital. Thank you so much, um, Jojo, Manish, Long, RV, SB, and Laila. But before you go, three words. Um, in terms of describing digital bank, just quickly, uh, Jojo, without yeah, expounding, yeah. just three words. It's it's go time. <laughs> okay, that's two words. <laughs> it's go time. It's time for us to really do this. Great, thank you, SB. Since we started on that theme, uh, Maya pay Maya turbo charged. Nice, and uh, Laila. Well, accessible, innovative, client-centric. Perfect. And Manish? Yeah. Let me deviate from the theme. <laughs> no, inclusive, secure, and uh, accessible. 
Thank you. Long, you're on mute. Uh, let me make it four. The bank in your pocket. Oh, that, that's like a slogan. And yeah, thank you, Long. And RV? Eka Pilipinas. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Um, over to you, Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bai, Mr. Devera, Mr. Malolos, Ms. Martin, and Ms. Pineda, and Ida. And of course, uh, Governor Jokno, who had to leave early. Um, thank you again to our speaker and panelists for sharing your time and expertise uh, with us. Uh, I'd like to invite, uh, anyway, um, yeah, we already had our photo op. So uh, no, uh, I guess it's two o'clock. It's time for us to adjourn. This is really exciting. We had over 300 attendees, I think close to 400. Actually, uh, it's uh, four, 500, including um, Facebook Live. Wow. 490 um, earlier on here, very well attended. So that's a good sign for you guys. Uh, wish you all the success and uh, thank you for pioneering this uh, technology and this service for people. And uh, yeah, we should have more of these, Ida. Excellent, so thank you. Thank you again. I, I, I'm i glad we got a lot of questions there. Mm -hmm. So um, let's see you guys back hopefully for round two. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Everybody, Bye -bye. stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Stay healthy. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Goodbye, everyone.